As a middle grades librarian and an avid reader of historical fiction, I am very excited to introduce our authors this morning. Catherine Marsh is an award-winning author of novels for middle grades readers, including The Lost Year, a survival story of the Ukrainian famine, a Junior Library Guild selection, Nowhere Boy, a New York Times notable and the Washington Post best book, and The Night Tourist, winner of the Edgar Award for Best Juvenile Mystery. Catherine grew up in Yonkers, New York, in the home of her Ukrainian grandmother. A former journalist and managing editor of The New Republic, she now lives in Washington, D.C. with her husband and two children. L. M. Elliott was an award-winning Washingtonian Magazine senior writer, primarily covering women's issues before becoming a New York Times bestselling author of historical and biographical fiction. Her docudrama-style Cold War novel, Walls, set in Berlin when the infamous wall goes up, is an NCSS CBC notable, Bank Street College of Education best book, and Kirkus 100 best young adult novel. Her other works include Suspect Red, An Exploration of McCarthyism and the winner of the Grateful American Book Prize, Hamilton and Peggy, Under a War-Torn Sky, Louisa June and the Nazis in the Wave, and Bia and the New Deal Horse. She is a lifelong Virginian and history lover. Please join me in welcoming Catherine Marsh and L.M. Elliott. Thank you. Thank you. Um, if I speak without a mic, can you hear me in the back? Okay, I think I'm gonna do that just to keep one hand I'm free. Okay. <laughs> um, and I'm gonna walk over here as well. Now, can, is that okay for the camera and your production if I don't use the mic? Or would you prefer me to use the mic? Mic, okay, I've gotta use the mic. I'm gonna try to do this. Uh, Oh, let's do that. Yeah. Oh, I would love the wireless. Okay. Thank you very much. So I'm Catherine Marsh, and uh, I'm really pleased to be here today. Thank you to the Gaithers Book Book, book Festival. Um, can folks see this screen over here? Is this too? Can you see with the reflection? Okay, great. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself and my book, uh, The Lost Year. Um, so this is the cover of The Lost Year, and I like to point out that it was designed um, by a young artist named Maria Skliarova, who is in Ukraine, um, and uh, is from Kharkiv, if you know where that is in Ukraine, which is one of the areas that has been uh, very affected by the current war. All right, so I grew up in Yonkers, New York, with my Ukrainian grandmother, Natalia, and there she is with me. Um, and uh, when, we were, when I was about four and a half, five, I moved into her house with my parents, and I grew up there, and um, she became a second mother to me. We were very, very close. And I used to spend a lot of time in her room uh, because she had the biggest TV, and she watched the <laughs> trashiest shows, um, and she had all the, like, you know, contraband, like, chocolate and hard candies I wanted. Um, but she also told really wonderful stories about her life in Ukraine. And um, just to tell you a little bit about that, she had a very difficult journey to this country. She came in 1928, which was a really tough year to come because in 1924, the US passed an immigration act that limited the number of people from Asia, Eastern Europe, and Southern Europe as they were considered less desirable immigrants. Um, so she actually, when she left Ukraine, um, had to go, and there's a picture of her, all the way to first she went to Mexico, and then she went to Cuba um, trying to get in, and finally she actually got in through Florida because she had a brother who had come before her. Um, and she ended up in Chicago and then in New York City. Um, so she had a very hard journey, um, and that's what she looked like when she came to America, and I just love the contrast of those pictures. So when I was little, my grandmother had this photo in her room, and I used to love looking at this. And this is a photo of the two sisters she left behind and their children, uh, my mother's first cousins. And I used to look at this photo, and they looked so sad. It was such a haunting photo. And, you know, I wanted to know why. And part of it was that photo was taken in the 1930s. Um, and during that time in Ukraine, there is something going on called in Ukrainian the Holodomor, which was a man-made famine, a famine that was orchestrated by Stalin, um, in which an estimated four million Ukrainians, men, women, and children, died. And those estimates, by the way, are still being researched. There are different numbers used, but um, that is one of the academically accepted ones at the moment. 
Um, that famine also affected the North Caucasus and Kazakhstan, but it was primarily in Ukraine. And Stalin did this um, because he was worried about Ukrainian resistance. So there's a lot of historical parallels with what's going on today. But I knew about this famine when I was growing up because my grandmother had a cousin, and there's a picture of her there, who came in 1933, who was able to get into the country because her father was here, and she survived this famine. And she used to tell a story about how in winter in her village it was absolutely silent. You couldn't hear any noise, no dogs, no cats, no birds, because people had eaten them all. People ate bark, they ate whatever they could, they boiled grass, um, and she used to tell us these, these stories. Um, so I knew about this, but then I found it so interesting that when I told people about it, no one else seemed to know. Like Americans were like, what? I've never heard of this. And there's a reason for that. So that was my grandmother's cousin who came and told us what she had experienced. And by the way, she lived to 106. Wow. All right, so I decided I wanted to write a story about this so Americans would know about the famine. And um, I sat down to do this in 2019. And then, of course, what happened? The pandemic happened. <laughs> and I was stuck at home with my, um, my husband, my mother who we moved in, and my two kids who were at that point a tween and a, actually a teen and a tween. Um, and this is a slide my son actually made during that time. He has really bad handwriting. <laughs> but he says, mommy is mad and sad. His sister's tired and mad. Baba, who's his grandmother, is complainy. Dad is mad, which makes me sad, mad, tired, and complainy. <laughs> um, and I think this pretty, sum pretty much sums up how we were all feeling during this time. He was home from school. And suddenly, that became part of my book, too. And I realized I wanted to write about the famine, but I also wanted to write about what it was like for kids at this time, in the beginning of the uh, <laughs> pandemic. What did kids do? They played a lot of games. Um, my son really likes Legends of Zelda, so I decided that I would write about a kid just like him <laughs> who is 13 years old, stuck home from school, bored during the pandemic, and he ends up just playing Zelda all the time. And it's a, it's a great game, actually, because it's also about a character that's trying to regain lost memories. And so it sort of fit into this theme of the famine where a lot of these stories had been buried and suppressed. So anyway, so I started writing it, and... Um, you know, basically, Matthew is stuck at home, and his great-grandmother, who was born in Ukraine, has moved in with him. And one day, he gets in trouble, has to help her clear out her stuff, and he sees this picture, which I decide to use this picture that I'd actually grown up with, of these two girls holding hands. And um, he shows it to his great-grandmother, saying, hey, well, that's you, one of them, right? And she bursts into tears. She gets completely flustered and freaked out. And he realizes that there's a mystery here, that there's something about her life that happened that she doesn't want to talk about. And that is the beginning of the lost year. And I use that as a way to tell the story of three cousins, the Lomachenko cousins, um, who are Nadia, who is his great-grandmother, um, and Nadia is um, from a small village in Ukraine, um, who are the people, and her, she's from a Kulak background, which were the sort of small landowners and were the ones most affected by the famine. Um, Mila, whose father is a communist member of the Ukrainian Communist Party. They live in Kiev. She has a life of, of luxury compared to a lot of kids. Um, and Helen, whose story is very much based on my mother, who is the daughter of a Ukrainian and Belarusian immigrant, as was my mother, who grows up in East New York, Brooklyn. So that is the story of the lost year, is these three cousins. And Mila is missing, we find out. Something happened to her. She's not in that picture. And that is sort of what my readers have to help figure out along with Matthew. You're sort of going along on a, on a detective story. So how am I doing on time? You're great. I'm Just great. Keep going. OK, I'm going to finish going. a few things then. So as I was writing this book, I finished it. It went into copy edits. And in February of 2022, um, Russia did their massive attack of Ukraine. Um, and I still have family there I keep in touch with. But obviously, I started thinking a lot. We were in copy edits. And I was able to sort of acknowledge this, this phase of history <laughs> in my author's note. Um, but there are definitely historical parallels that jumped out at me from 2022-23 and 1932-33 when this famine happened. Um, so there basically, um, let's see, oh, that may be the end. Okay. Oh, no, there we go. So 
Some of those parallels um, are obviously the use of food as a political weapon, which we see today. Um, there is also the use of disinformation and propaganda, which you know I'm sure Laura and I will talk about this, but we're both journalists and really interested in the way that kids um, take in media and uh, media literacy. So this was also an example, um, a time in which there was a lot of disinformation, especially about the famine. So that was something I wanted to dig into. And we see that again today with Russia's use of propaganda. Um, so the third parallel, which is the kind of the one closest to my heart, and I'm going to end with this, is that my grandmother spent 70 years writing letters back and forth to her sisters and their family. Um, she had a brother there, too, who died in the Second World War. Um, but she spent, and I remember how happy she was when those letters used to arrive in the mail. I'd bring them up to her, and she'd be so overjoyed because finally she could, like, hear what was going on in their lives and share what was going on in her lives. And she helped them over the years. And in fact, she used to um, send them what are called in Ukrainian posilki, um, which are little packages. And she would sometimes hide money in them or things. And I actually use that in the book. Um, but anyway, I studied. Russian in high school and college, I, you know, at that point. Um, and I studied, uh, I was able to go to the Soviet Union twice mm. through my studies, and I was able to meet my family. So I also established a connection with them. And now, just as my grandma worried for all those years about her family, I <laughs> certainly worry about mine, including my cousin who lives in Kiev right now, and um, his wife, who are just expecting a baby, actually. So I'm going to end with that, and I'm sure there'll be lots more for us to talk about. Um, I'm going to pass it to Laura, but thank you so much, and I hope you check out The Lost Year. That's what I really need. I can't remember where I I can't see. I can't see. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to do, I've got notes so that I keep to time. Um, so. I have to tell you, I'm so excited to be on the stage with Kate. This is a beautiful book. If you guys haven't read it yet, you really must. It gives you so much, um, so much really beautiful humanitarian show rather than tell what life was like in Ukraine at that time and family connections. It's really gorgeous. So I hope you'll read it. Um, walls. So I'm going to give. Oh, thank you. Thank you. So I'm going to work through this quickly. Um, Walls takes place in 1961 Berlin when American soldiers uh, stood toe to toe against Soviet Russian troops. The volatile year when Russia and its puppet state, East Germany, would plot to raise a 27 mile barricade literally overnight, you guys, um, to cage millions of East Berliners. The idea for Walls came from me when the former president criticized NATO, and I started wondering, do people remember why NATO was formed? So I started asking teenagers. You know, the reason for it was Russia's brutal annexation of Eastern Europe after World War II, plus its Cold War aggression against West Berlin and any bordering nations um, that they felt threatened the Soviet bloc of puppet states. So I did start asking teens what they knew about NATO, and I got a, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and then I started asking about, this is an old reporter technique, right? What do you guys know? Um, and then I started asking about the Berlin Wall, and I got a, uh, it came down, right? <laughs> so, you know, here this was this proverbial hole in coverage. So, um, and honestly, what could be a more dramatic show rather than tell story humanizing the dangers and the politics of Cold War and Russia's longstanding antipathy to Western democracies than that cruel war? I tell the story through two teens from opposing sides, like I had done with my McCarthyism book. Drew, an American army kid whose sergeant dad is stationed with the Berlin Brigade, and his cousin Matthias, an East German raised in anti-American propaganda in the Soviet sector. Their mothers want them to be friends, even though the boys aren't so sure about that, um, despite the really risky s scrutiny that it brings both teens. For Drew, the suspicion that his family might be overly friendly with communists, and therefore his dad a potential security risk, susceptible to KGB overtures, which I will tell you all happened constantly on the American Post. I was flabbergasted when I read about KGB people coming and literally putting notes in American soldiers' mailboxes. Um, for Matthias, increased surveillance from Spitzel, the neighborhood spies working for the Stasi secret police. Um, 
what, so I wanted to look at what was it be like for an American military kid stationed in this dangerous place and moment in history where his dad could be mobilized literally at any moment against a nuclear armed foe a couple blocks down. Um, how would that teenager find the compassion and the open-mindedness to care about a communist kid who calls Americans capitalist pigs and is signed a pledge to pick up a gun and shoot at NATO soldiers like Drew's dad if the government told him to? And then what would it be like for Matthias, who's been inculcated in communist dogma, caught up in the ardor and the camaraderie of the FDJ, the Free German Youth, to shake off the lies spun by this big brother police state to trust a Westerner? Those felt really poignant and powerful questions to explore, especially in this time of deep political polarization within our own country and the role of disinformation in that divide. So first, really quick, because I have some students here I can see, and for adults too, a bare bone reminder of how Berlin became the Cold War's epicenter. In World War II, our alliance with Soviet Russia had been a wary but necessary one. But as Russia liberated Eastern European countries from the Nazis, they took them over, right? And dropping what Winston Churchill would call an iron curtain, severing those nations from Western democracy. Some of those countries, Russia simply absorbed. Other, you can, I hope you can see that map. Um, Others return to a band of satellite Soviet bloc nations. Now, to restore order in Germany and purge it of Nazism, the US, England, and France occupied its western half to establish a new democracy. Russia retained the eastern zone. Now, here's the weird thing. Because it had been Hitler's capital, Berlin was also divided into Allied-controlled sectors. But here's a critical geography to remember, if you can see on the map on the right. Berlin was buried 100 miles inside Russia's communist zone. Now, immediately after World War II, Russia barricaded East Germany's border, making a death strip with landmines and dog patrols. Um, Russia the bear, in that cartoon, encircled Berlin as well. Americans could only enter along roads or trains controlled by communist forces. My guy drew to go play um, a game uh, against other American high schools in the free zone of Germany would have to ride a duty train that was run and controlled by communist forces. 1961, a mere 11,000 American, British, and French soldiers guarded West Berlin. They were surrounded, though, by 400,000 Russian troops, East Germany's army, um, paramilitary factory workers, and police. Please never forget the courage of those who stood post there and the families they brought with them to what JFK aptly described, an island of freedom in a communist sea. It was a real joy for me to actually be able to feature military kids who have stunning resiliency in all the moves they have to make six to nine times between kindergarten and when they graduate high school. Um, they're not written about enough. Within Berlin itself, up until August 61, residents could cross the internal sectors from communist to democratic and back again, which made the city this potential escape hatch. Now, if East and East German managed to make it into Berlin after evading secret police, paid informers, and neighbors who feared being arrested themselves if they didn't report someone, he or she might slip into the American sector and beg asylum at a refugee camp called Marienfelde that we ran. If they were caught, however, they were charged with treason. Um, despite those dire risks, hundreds of East Germans tried each week, which infuriated Russia. So in 1948, determined to starve American troops out of Berlin and um, the West Berliners into submitting, Russia, um, Soviet Russia blockaded Berlin. For 11 grueling months, our Air Force had to land cargo planes every, 30, um, every three minutes at our Tempelhof base round the clock, no matter how perilous the weather, bringing in fu food, fuel, medicine to West Berlin. Those are hungry children waiting by the runways. And they, the pilots started seeing those kids out there, so they started throwing treats out the windows and became known as candy bombers. Finally, Russia relented, but this is what caused NATO. <laughs> it was in reaction to this ruthless takeover attempt um, that the Western democracies formed NATO. No matter how much Russia then and now claims NATO threatens its sovereignty, NATO was born as a self-protective alliance against Russian attack. 1960, in East, this is East Berlin. Children's played in World War II rubble that was left as a reminder of American bombing. And in the shadow of enormous banners like this two-story image of the Russian bear protecting East Germans by pushing away a NATO soldier tout, you know, carrying missiles. 
Being a good communist made a child a hero. The slogan across that building is Berlin Youth Fight for Peace and the Victory of Socialism. Absolute, absolute obedience to the state was required. To attend university, a youth had to give up religion and instead participate in a catechism on Marxism and a Jungenvia, which was a youth consecration, consecration in which they pledged their allegiance to Russia, the best friend of the German people. Teens were expected to report classmates who didn't wave flags enthusiastically enough at parades. If you look at the photograph, there, there are a couple of girls who don't look all that happy. I hope they didn't get turned in. Because if they were, they would have been pulled in front of a peer tribunal to give an official self-criticism. And boy, oh boy, it better be contrite enough. Youth attended paramilitary summer camps and signed a pledge. You can read the whole thing there. But it basically says, because of the threat of war by NATO, it is a moral consequence of my political convictions that I, as a young socialist, defend the sacrificial struggle of the working class. American music was banned. Teens listening to radio broadcasts drifting into the east from the city's American sector or somehow possessing a barbaric Elvis rock and roll record or dancing the, quote, bestial provocative wiggle hip of the twist could be accused of culture barbare. I'm sorry, culture corruption bringing, it actually meant bringing a degenerative virus into the pure-minded socialist society. It was akin to sedition. A kid who was accused of that could be sent to a re-education camp. Music, however, is what connects Drew and Matthias. Despite its dangers, American jazz and rock and roll were powerful draws for Germans trapped in the communist zone. You know, radio waves, you guys, they were radio waves once upon a time. It drifted free on the air. And you could tune your radio into it, almost like imagination, right? And they could hear you know, artistic freedom and a little bit of youth um, defiance of, a, of authority, which was poison in the communists' minds. Um, they would do it, but the risks were enormous. Um, Khrushchev and Kennedy met in June 61 to discuss a possible nuclear arms accord, but it was a disaster. JFK came back and said basically that Khrushchev beat the hell out of him. Excuse me, I'm quoting. <laughs> um, Khrushchev also famously bragged that Russia would, quote, destroy the U.S. from within by fueling conspiracy theories that would divide and weaken America. He called Berlin the testicles of the West. When I want the West to scream, I squeeze on Berlin. He also threatened that he had sufficient weapons to destroy all American military bases. He demanded that NATO stop challenging Russia's rights and, and um, demand of Berlin. And if not, quote, we must respond. It is up to the U.S. to decide whether there will be peace or war. That was the powder keg that the world was sitting on in the summer of 1961. Their fail failed summit sparked a closing door panic. East Germans flooded Marienfelder, our refugee camp, 30,000 in July 61 alone. The Communist Party went into disinformation overdrive, claiming anyone who escaped had not defected out of dissatisfaction or longing for intellectual freedom, but because of mental handle, being lured in a Western abduction of workers for a capitalist slave trade. In truth, most were fleeing persecution or malnourishment, akin to what Kate has described in, in Ukraine, that stemmed from Russia plundering East German crops to send back to Moscow. Do you see the expression of the little girl on the right being handed a banana at Marie? Felda, it's the first she's ever seen in her entire life. The Stasi secret police even planted spies in Marienfelde, posing as refugees. That man hiding his face knows that there's Stasi infiltrators looking to gain information to blackmail refugees into becoming moles once they relocate it in the West, or to punish their relatives left in Germany, which is exactly what happened to Marlene Schmidt, Miss Universe here. She was an electrical engineer, well-employed and favored in East Germany. She even had an apartment with her own bathroom um, until her mother and sister escaped to the West. Then she was threatened with arrest for not having turned them in. She decided at that point to flee herself. She will win the Miss Universe contest representing West Germany, which prompted Russia propaganda to denounce her as being seduced to, you know, to prostitute herself for a tiara. After months of secretly stockpiling barbed wire, concrete posts, and protective gloves, Operation Rose kicked into gear at midnight on a holiday of children's festivals. Happily distracted by citywide fireworks, Berliners hadn't noticed military trucks gathering on the edge of the city. 
And as most Berliners slept, 38,000 East German soldiers, transportation and border guards, factory militia and police were mobilized. They began unfurling 330 tons of wire, shut down all trains, doused streetlights, sealed sewer manholes as Russian tanks surrounded the city with orders to crush any uprising. By dawn, 27 miles of barbed wire split the city. Berliners awoke to militiamen already digging up cobblestones to plant the pre-made posts to secure the wire. Radio trucks troll broadcasting that the wall was to protect the good German people from the warmongers in the West who scheme against us. Remain calm. Rejoice. After years of anti-American propaganda, many believed the wall was for their own protection or simply temporary. They stood and watched. Those who protested were thrown into police vans. Anxious crowds gathered on either side, Westerners shouting at loved ones to jump the fence while they still could. Youth stood down youth. Some grabbed whatever they could and ran before the fencing was entirely sealed. They only had a few hours to do so. Many East Berlin streets had buildings flush to the um, free zone. Some brave souls actually climbed out the windows like the grandmother up there on the left. Now look carefully on the right. Do you see that child dropping through the air? That child was dropped three stories into a net held below by West German firemen. That's how much his family wanted him to be free. Most families, however, could only pass emergency food and money over the wire, and for many it would be the last time that they ever touched one another. Cinderblock was carefully added to the barrier, quickly, sorry. From then on, Germans could only wave over the fence to one another, like on the right. If they dared to rush the wall like 18-year-old Peter Fechter, who was one of the first to die, they would be shot. The wall divided Germans for almost three decades until 1989 when Berliners tore down the fence with hammers and crowbars. Not everyone rejoiced, however. Some Russians mourned, controlled the dozen countries it had um, swallowed up at the end of World War II, sorry, including Vladimir Putin there. Um, he was a young KGB officer at the time in East Germany. He was hunting down dissidents and trying to um, turn moles to steal NATO military secrets. And with him passed his prologue, both with his inhumane aggressions and claims that victims of atrocity in Ukraine are actually st uh, staging them themselves. And as one dissident described the KGB, if the snow is falling, they will calmly tell you that the sun is shining. That's history in a... Tw in 12-minute lesson. <laughs> Thank you. Do you all have questions for us? Well, we can ask each other things. <laughs> yeah, go ahead, Fred. Yeah, there are a couple reasons we don't know. One is the suppression by Stalin and his government, who uh, just basically said there was no famine, um, that that was fake news. And it was happening mostly in Ukraine. So if you were living in a, a different part of Russia, you might not know that it was going on. Um, in addition, what I found interesting as an American journalist is that one of the most um, important and this is something I worked into the book, one of the most important uh, reports that came out on the famine um, that was contemporaneous was by a reporter named Walter Durante, who worked for the New York Times, um, and he was the Russia correspondent. He'd won Pulitzers. He was very, you know, uh, esteemed. Um, but he was also, Stalin would not let foreign journalists leave Moscow. And if you did so, you did so without the permission of the authorities. And Walter Durante wanted to be on the good side of the authorities, and he also got a lot of perks from uh, Stalin. Um, and so he reported what the official line was. And famously, there is a New York Times story that said Ukrainians, or actually it said Russians, because at that point they were talking about Ukraine as well. Russians are hungry, he wrote, but not starving. Um, and it took a bunch of actual citizens, some of them were citizen journalists, some of them were journalists from other countries, who either, um, in some cases, there is one from the Jewish community who had uh, his brothers, 
were actually communist officials, which gave him uh, in Ukraine, which gave him more freedom to travel around. And so he um, was able to actually witness what was going on and write about it. Um, but that was only in the Yiddish papers. Um, there's a Canadian journalist um, who's, who went in by herself, just drove down there <laughs> and also reported. And then most famously, there is Gareth Jones, who is a, um, a Welsh political advisor who spoke Russian um, and went into Ukraine himself and wrote about what he saw, which was you know, mass starvation. But those reports didn't carry as much weight as Durante's because of his position. And it's a really wonderful, I think, um, and vivid example of how disinformation can actually shape history. I'll ask you a question. <laughs> Um, tell me about, I was really fascinated by, and it's difficult, you all, to write multiple POVs and different time frames, but I think it really synthesized themes beautifully for you. Can you talk a little bit about why you chose to do the different time frames and the different POVs? Sure. So I am um, in the lost year. We hear from the perspective of Matthew, who's the 13-year-old who is in modern-day New Jersey and uh, going through the early part of the COVID pandemic. Um, we hear from Mila, who is the daughter of the Communist Party official, um, and we also hear uh, from Helen, who is the uh, American, uh, but uh, from a Ukrainian immigrant background. Um, and I felt it was important to have all those perspectives, and Nadia, the one who actually experiences the famine, her story is told through Mila, and there's a reason for that um, that I will not... Uh, give away. I will not divulge. <laughs> but, um, but it is hard to write multiple perspectives, but each of these perspectives represented, all of the characters represented different, um, different experiences um, also in my family. Um, my grandmother's background was most like Nadia's. She came from a small village. Um, my mother's background is very much like Helen, and I used a lot of the details um, including that, you know, my mother used to take caviar sandwiches to school and kids would laugh at her. Um, and she, you know, was very embarrassed. Um, and, you know, that was something I was able to work into the book because she wanted to be an American. Um, and then I actually had spent, I spent some time when I was in the Soviet Union, not to date myself, um, but at a very famous communist youth camp as an exchange camper from America. We were the American delegation um, at a place called Artek, which is in Crimea. And so I spent a summer there, and that was really the waning days of the Soviet Union, and I got to see some of the sort of things that, you know, that Mila would have experienced as herself as a young pioneer, and the young pioneers are like the communist Girl Scouts and Boy Scouts. Um, and uh, so, you know, all of those perspectives went into the characters and, and informed the voices of the characters, and that made it, I think, a bit easier for me. But I'm also a mystery writer, um, and so, you know, that's, I, I've won the Edgar, that's what I do, I create mysteries. And there's a big surprise in this book, we're not gonna talk about it, um, but what I always challenge young readers is see if you could figure it out before Matthew what really happened to his family, because there's a huge family secret there. So, uh, yeah, did someone have, did you have a question? Okay, that's okay, I'm done, I was gonna ask, okay, please, go ahead. Um, yeah. You know, I, did, I found that quote particularly frightening. frightening yeah. Since it's like, it's like so fair Happening now. now. Yes. I have a teacher's packet I want to give you okay. before you leave, okay. which is all about how you. I've done a lot of their lesson plans and. A video I did with, uh, forgive me, I'm going to say Fall for the Book um, Festival, but it's all about disinformation and how it repeats itself through history and how you can help kids recognize it. Often it's easier for them to recognize in a story like we've done, in a narrative where they can 
empathize and worry about characters rather than being thrown a blank or you know being thrown at what do you see there it's like see it instead through our characters um, I actually this has been a theme of three books of mine now the first was with um, a book on McCarthyism that I wrote that um, is all about book banning and disinformation and un-American activities and being called disloyal if you are, um, you know, if you question the status quo, if you were involved with civil rights, um, you were a, you were, you were labeled as a pinko, yeah, and you would have been called potentially in front of McCarthy's Senate committee. Um, so Suspect Red is about that. Berlin became very much about, the walls became very much about that as well. That's why I always, in both Suspect Red and in Walls, and something I've just done on Watergate, I have two teens on opposite sides of the political spectrum. Um, it, disinformation is a terrifyingly potent thing. When I showed you those photographs, I was going through very quickly, but there were hundreds, thousands of East Berliners who went, yes, rejoice. We're going to be safe from the demon Americans with their wiggle hip and their terrible, you know. They ha we laugh about it, but it, because it's so ridiculous because how innocent is the twist? But it was so purposeful and um, done throughout their lifetimes that they really came to believe that we were after them. We were going to do anything we could to undo their just, new just society. I didn't put the photograph, because sometimes I have younger kids in, um, but they even, there's one of mass toilet training. They began when they were toddlers, making them all go at the same time to learn obedience to the state and to be working as a collective, okay? Um, we have our own issues with disinformation. I go back to the Red Scare and um, things that are happening now. And it is critically, critically important that our teenagers learn to be able to say, does that make sense? Is that really a degenerative dance that's going to throw me into, you know? It's really, really important. And I think Kate's book um, really, if you can read our books together, and I do have these lesson plans that I will give you, um, I think it's a way that's a little less intimidating for teens to be able to think about this. Yeah, I would, I would agree with that. Um, I'll just add that Matthew, my 13-year-old protagonist, is the son of a reporter. Um, and that is something I did intentionally, both having, yeah, being a journalist, and my husband is also uh, a reporter as well. Um, and I did that also because I wanted to talk to kids about how the sausage is made. And I think that's a really important part of media literacy, is to talk about what goes into reliable journalism. And in my book, Matthew ends up writing down the story he learns. He, ha he decides he's going to be the oral historian. And oral history is another very big part of this book. And Matthew really struggles. And he struggles as a writer. He struggles to sort of know how to present the material. Um, and that was something I hear often when I go to schools from teachers about kids really sort of, you know, I love talking to kids who actually hate writing. That's something I love doing um, because I think it's really important not to judge yourself as a writer because you hate it because often I hate it. Um, and what goes into it is really caring about it and revision. Um, but to get back to the media literacy piece, you know, this was something I was working at the Washington Post last spring as an editor there. Um, and, you know, this is something that I worry about a lot because when I was visiting kids at schools, I was hearing things like, so where do you guys get your information? Is it social media or is it your local newspaper? And I'd name the local newspaper and guess what they said? <laughs> Not just social media, but they'd say, what? What's that? They'd never heard of the local newspaper. Um, and local newspapers, sadly, are dying, and they will continue to do so because of that. But I think it's really important, and this is something that I do in the book in the context of, of a story that's hopefully fun and has a mystery, is to talk a little bit about how you, um, how you gauge the information you get, how, how a good journalist puts that together. And that's being, for example, having multiple sources. That's a really important thing. Um, another, you know, and there's a whole bunch of things that I also have. I have a teacher's guide where we talk about some of the things that you should be on the lookout for um, when you're looking either at social media or just regular media. Um, and, you know, I, th I think the last thing that's really important um, is, you know, to be able to, to be a critical thinker um, and to be an open and curious thinker. 
And I actually, you know, I have a Ukrainian grandmother, but I also have a, had a Belarusian grandfather. Um, that side of the family is not Jewish. My father's side of the family is Jewish and came from a very similar area. In fact, my two grandfathers came from different worlds, probably 100 miles apart. And because of that, I don't like to see things necessarily, um, you know, as, as us versus them. It's really important. Um, you know, I've spent time in Russia. I've spent time in Ukraine. Um, and I think that we can state things that are morally wrong, but at the same time, we can look at individuals as individuals. And that is a really important thing, I think, for Americans, too, at this moment, where we tend to polarize and we tend to see our enemies as almost inhuman. Um, and I think that is a really important part of the lost year as well. Yeah, it's stereotyping is the issue of having this mindset. And both I in both these books, Suspect Red and Walls, the teenagers have to overcome what they've been inculcated to believe about the other through personal experience. You know, it's like, oh, he doesn't really talk like that. He really, and at one point I have Matthias who has a droll sense of humor, which helps me make him endearing to you when he is sometimes spouting um, political dogma that infuriates the reader, is that he'll, he actually at one point looks at Drew and says, um, you know, I don't see horns and a tail on you, gee. <laughs> so, anyway. You know, I have to say that your kind of work and what like AFN was doing during the 60s was so important. There's this amazing anecdote. I, I did a lot of reporting for this book in that I was able to find Berlin brats who had been teenagers in 60s, you know, they're in their late 70s now, who told me all these amazing stories, like the fact that there were all these kidnapping atta attempts of American personnel and their families. Um, but there was also this story that I read that the music, the music would draw a lot of the youth. And there was, um, David Brubeck went and actually did in a State Department cultural um, diplomacy, went to perform, and they pirated, they, they recorded and pirated his performance, and they could only do it though they found old x-rays of, com chest x-rays of communist chests and hearts, and American jazz was recorded over top of that. I just love the imagery of that. I love that detail. So. Yeah, that's, that's truly a wonderful detail, and Laura's book has a, a number of them. So. Well, it's reporting. I mean, honestly, and my daughter's sitting back here, and she's going to go, yeah, she's going to talk about footnotes now. But footnotes, you guys! <laughs> the best. And all those primary documents, you know, I wanted to show you those photographs because I can tell you yak, yak, yak at you guys. But if you can see that child dropping three stories, if you can see that child being, oh my God, it's a banana, that tells you in a visceral way, you know, much more than I'm a good, I, I like to think I'm a good writer, but you know, a photograph like that, a primary document, you guys, you love primary documents, right? So um, they give you that and that's what newspapers used to do, right? And hopefully and still do. Same. Still do, yeah. Any other questions? So, Laura, let me ask you a question. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, so, I'm curious whether you uh, had, did you travel there for this book? Did you spend any time there? Were you able to see the places that you were writing about? No, it's the only time that I haven't gone to the place where I was reporting, and it made me crazy. But I'm old enough now to, and here's Gussie Lewis, who I have to thank because she was the first person who really um, promoted me among schools, and I'm so grateful to you, Gussie, always. It was 20 years ago. When I first did Under a War-Torn Sky, which was inspired by my dad's experiences as a B-24 bomber pilot, I couldn't get, there weren't all these amazing digital collections. So I did have to go to France. Gosh darn, it was terrible. We, got, we went to France um, and interviewed people and, and went to like, you know, not state-run museums, but little local community museums, which is where you get your hands on, you know, the real stuff that family members have. I couldn't do that because COVID happened. Yeah. 
but I can now get into that stuff through digital um, archives. And also, because of having been a reporter, I think, I don't mind admitting that I don't know something and to ask people. And my son had a friend um, who was actually a native Berliner who had gone home. And I said, can you go to all these museums for me, please, and just surreptitiously photograph everything? <laughs> and he did. <laughs> and so that helped me a lot. But normally, I would have been trying to go through everything, and I do hope to go someday. Yeah. Well, I think COVID has is, is made it a lot tougher to do a lot of things. And, you know, um, so I think we're, we're getting close to wrapping up. Does anybody have a final question before we uh, do? Any last questions? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I just finished, so my mind is a little blurred. Um, actually, my editor of Walls asked me to do something about Watergate. So I did, but 1973, you all should know, was an incredibly pivotal year. It wasn't just Watergate, the unraveling of Watergate, but it was the undoing of the ERA by lies and propaganda from certain people and Roe. So it's a lot. That, that's what I've just finished up. So I, um, this book, Lost Year, was so personal for me, and, and it just really, I think having the war ramp up just as it, you know, went into copy edits, it just, it tore my heart apart, um, frankly. And uh, I wrote this story, I wrote this book for my grandma, I wrote it for, you know, for her people, <laughs> um, and afterwards I really needed to do something different, and so I write uh, in a lot of different genres. Um, my previous book, Nowhere Boy, is a contem what was a contemporary and is now becoming a historical <laughs> fiction story that was set in 2015 in Brussels um, during the refugee crisis there where I was living at the time. Um, but my next book goes back to fantasy and I've written a lot of Greek mm. myth and fantasy and my next is gonna be a series um, called uh, The Myth of Monsters and the first book is called Medusa and it's a feminist retelling of the Ooh. Medusa story. Ooh. So that was like a <laughs> nice, like I, I have to say I needed to do something that was a little bit less um, heavy for me um, and less personal, so. You all should just know how much talent it takes to be able to jump around in those kinds of <laughs> genres. Thank you, everyone, for being here today. Thank you very much. We really appreciate it. <laughs>